Hello, and welcome to Leftover Time, a show about reheated food and NBA takes. As is always the case on the show, we are going to be taking a look at a piece of food that we might otherwise throw away and seeing if we can find a way to recover it, while at the same time stretching ourselves to come up with a worthwhile NBA analogy for the method of which we are going to be cooking the food. Today's topic, French fries. And on the NBA take side of things, three former number one overall picks who cooled wildly and never quite reached superstardom, but learned their role in the toughest league in the world. Let's begin with the fries. Now, French fries are typically eaten entirely or discarded like those inflatable tubes they give to fans to wave and clap to distract a free throw shooter. There is seldom any kind of need to ask for a to-go box. They can't hold their luster, especially after a night in the fridge. Now, just like a top draft pick who for, you know, a hundred reasons looks to be a star to build a team around, only ends up disappointing the fans who expected so much more. So how do we save these fries from the landfill while also saving our palates? Well, the same way a former number one overall pick revitalized a disappointing career, by learning their role. To start, let's slice up some veggies. We're slicing these veggies into long strips similar to the shape of a french fry. The natural shape of the onion kind of makes this fairly simple, and the peppers nearly need an additional slice to prep it for shaping. So why are we slicing these instead of diced or whole or julienned or shaved? Well, because these veggies need to fit in to look the part, even if they are not going to be the star of the show. Each of the players that we're going to be discussing, yes, they were the number one overall draft pick, but they did not find success on the team that drafted them. It took a trade, a refocus of their skills and their role within a team. They had to look and fit the part. These veggies are going into a non-stick pan on medium-low heat with the barest dollop of oil. You don't really need a whole lot just to kind of get the sizzle to go. These are going to simmer until they start to soften without turning into that sort of stiff jelly that overcooked pan veggies can get. You know, once they are cooked, we're going to remove them from the pan until final assembly. Next up, the fries. These once hot and beautiful golden rods are now, well, they're sort of soggy and less lustrous. We're going to add the fries to the same non-stick pan set on medium-low and make sure that each fry is evenly spaced out. You will know the fries are done when you hear that telltale you know, sizzle. After several tosses, kind of reshuffling to make sure that they're always going to be staying separated. That separation is going to allow each fry to not steam each other. Sometimes separation is good. As mentioned before, each of these players did not stay with the team that drafted them. But by being traded, by having the, uh, the glamour and the esteem of what their function is as a number one overall pick, the expectation, by removing that, they were able to focus on the importance of the game, the skills they had, and how it could blend with every other team around them. By keeping the french fries separate, we removed some of the sogginess, the thing that made it, you know, lose the luster, the expectation that we had from it, and slowly bring to a level of heat. Remove onto a plate and immediately crack an egg into the pan and let it sit covered. After a minute or two on one side, the egg can be jostled free with the spatula or kind of gently or aggressively flipped in the pan if you have that skill. After another minute, minute, Drop that egg onto your bed of fries and veggies, dab up some hot sauce, and dig in. Now, you've waited long enough, let's get on to those former number one overall picks who developed into great role players. First up, Andrew Wiggins. From Toronto, Canada, Wiggins was selected first overall by the Cleveland Cavaliers in 2014. 
which was also the same year that LeBron James returned his talents to Ohio for after their South Beach getaway. LeBron was not about to tolerate a full youth movement, especially partnering with a number one overall pick who played the same position, did Wiggins. Now, Wiggins and another former number one overall pick, Anthony Bennett, were shipped to the Minnesota Timberwolves for all-star forward Kevin Love. Now, Wiggins, a small forward who played his one year of ball at Kansas, was billed as Maple Jordan, and in some ways he was. High-flying dunks over Rudy Gobert in his rookie year, a wicked but soon predictable spin move, and all-out efforts against the Cavaliers in attempted revenge games kind of sparked some high points amongst fans wondering what could be. More often than not, though, Wiggins turned in high-scoring but inefficient passive-aggressive games that would aggravate even the most kindly Canadian. After six and a half seasons on the Timberwolves, Wiggins, you know, averaging about 20 points per game or so and only reaching the playoffs once through the sheer will of Jimmy Butler, he was traded to the injured but still championship contending Golden State Warriors in 2020. After one and a half more so-so seasons, Wiggins finally learned his role. Now, amongst Hall of Famers, what he was tasked with was, you know, difficult, but something that he could very much fit into. He was able to defend the toughest wing and wait for his turn to shoot or cut. He still had his revenge games every once in a while, this time including the Wolves on his hit list, but mostly he remained average. The Warriors did reach the finals again in 2022, uh, and with Wiggins, were able to win. When asked how he transformed his games, Wiggins credited teammate Andre Iguodala, who told him that rebounding would happen a lot easier if he just jumped up and got the ball. Next, Joe Smith. Joe Smith was selected first overall by the Golden State Warriors in 1995. His primary position was power forward, and unfortunately, this fact alone is probably the biggest detriment or mark on Joe's career. You see, there were two players drafted after him, both power forwards, and both multi-time all-stars and starters on championship teams, Kevin Garnett and Rashid Wallace. For as good and hard-working and high-flying as Smith could be at times, he never touched the rarefied air and skill of KG and Sheed. Smith joined Latrell Sprewell on the Warriors, uh, and each of his subsequent two and a half years saw the Warriors go from bad to somehow worse, despite Smith's strong improvement from his rookie to sophomore season. Uh, midway through his third year, the Warriors elected to ship him to the Philadelphia 76ers, and so began Joe's odyssey. Small, separate stopovers with the Sixers, Timberwolves, Detroit Pistons, Timberwolves again, Milwaukee Bucks, Denver Nuggets, Sixers again, Chicago Bulls, Cleveland Cavaliers, Oklahoma City Thunder, Cleveland Cavaliers again, Atlanta Hawks, New Jersey Nets, and finally the Los Angeles Lakers, 12 of the league's 30 teams over the course of his 16-year career. Each stop, Smith offered his journeyman services of quick foot speed and fearless rebounding, while never staying anywhere long, even when he hoped to before the league found out about a under-the-table deal with your own Minnesota Timberwolves, Smith always brought tenacious effort regardless of locale. He was never an all-star, never a champion, but he remained in demand. And finally, Michael Thompson. Michael Thompson was drafted in 1978 by the Portland Trail Blazers. The Blazers traded their starting guard, John Davis, for the rights to select Thompson. Now, Thompson was the first non-American-born player selected first overall. Thompson was a big man joining a team whose starting big man, Bill Walton, had just won the MVP the previous season. While a top draft pick, Thompson joined a team where he would be lower on the pecking order. After eight years on the Blazers, earning all-rookie honors, backing up Walton, and frequently starting when the oft-injured and moody center was unavailable, Thompson would peak in his fourth season. 
From there, though, he was unable to really build upon his past success, further annoying Blazers fans who now wondered what if they had been patient and just selected Larry Bird and let him play his last year in college. Slowly, Thompson's numbers dwindled until 1987 when he was traded to the San Antonio Spurs. He played a half a season with the Spurs before another trade sent him to the championship contending LA Lakers. Now back again in a backup role, uh, this time supporting legendary center Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Thompson's career found new life. His statistics never really jumped back up, but his workman's attitude gave the aging Kareem precious moments of rest without the Lakers you know, having to give up the lead. Thompson was a part of two championship runs in 1987 and 1988 with the Lakers, the true peak of a 12-year career. As always, this show is about fun and a full stomach, and not wasting food. Each of the players I talked about today are NBA players. No one can take that away from them. They reach the pinnacle of their profession, they are good, and this first bite goes out to them for helping make the league we love that much better.